Would you pray with me once more as we prepare to approach God and his word? Oh, our mighty Father, holy and good, please speak to us today as we reflect upon your word and upon this story of Jesus calling his disciples to follow him. May we hear the same call today. In the name of Jesus we ask, amen. It's a well-known passage of scripture, a well-known story as Jesus calls these fishermen to follow and as Jesus calls Levi, Levi Matthew, the tax collector, to follow him. We're gonna focus on this call to follow, but before we get there, I wanna just say a few words about the remarkable obedience of Simon Peter. By all accounts, as people would have stood on the shore that day and looked at Jesus, the carpenter, and Peter, the fisherman, who would they have said was the expert at where to catch fish and how to catch them? It would have been Peter. Peter obviously has been doing this his whole life. He knows how to catch fish. And yet, Peter says, when, when Jesus says, Simon, I want you to uh, put, down your, put the boat out into deep water and put down your net, Peter says, Master, I haven't caught anything all night, but at your word, I will do it. He is an example to us of obedience. Many times we approach Jesus as our advisor rather than our master. And we're willing to obey him when it suits us and when it makes sense to us. But there are areas of life where we consider ourselves to be more expert than Jesus, if we're honest with ourselves. Areas of life where we think we've got it figured out, and maybe Jesus is a little backward, and maybe he doesn't quite understand. We forget who Jesus is. But only following Jesus when it suits us and when it makes sense is not actually following Jesus. It's not truly obeying Jesus. Peter is an example to us in this passage. But let's focus on the call. That's what I really want to talk about with you this morning. The call to follow Jesus. The call to discipleship. And we're going to approach this in three stages. We're going to talk about realization, leaving, and provision. So let's jump in with realization. And by realization, I mean the realization of who Jesus is. Notice that before Jesus makes the call and before Simon Peter can answer the call, there is this stunning realization that Peter experiences of who Jesus is. A lot of us, as we approach Jesus and we're feeling drawn to get to know him, and this was Peter's experience, This is not the first time Peter is mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, though it's the first time we really see him in action. The previous chapter, Jesus healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law. So clearly there was an existing relationship. There was an attraction that was taking place. Peter was being drawn towards Jesus, and now his boat is getting used for ministry. Peter thought he was going to spend the morning discouraged over no fish and mending his nets, washing his nets, and now suddenly the great teacher is preaching from his boat. And Peter, I'm sure, is proud of the fact that the teacher's using his boat. He's he's happy this is going on. He's excited to be around the teacher. And this is often the way with us as we are getting to know Jesus. There's this attraction. There's this curiosity. We want to get to know Jesus. Sometimes people will say, I don't need to go to church. I, I have an experience of God. I go out on the lake and, and I feel God close to me there. Or I hike in the mountains and, and I, I feel God near. I feel lifted up by his presence. Well, if that's your only experience of God, you're not meeting the true God. There's a piece missing. You're, you're still a, a long ways off because As people get closer to Jesus, as they get closer to God, there is something that always happens, and we see it happen with Peter after this miraculous catch of fish. 
that Peter suddenly realizes this is no ordinary man. This, this is not just a gentle, favorable Jesus that I can follow. This guy has power. This guy is far beyond my understanding. And Peter reacts with terror to Jesus. And he says, get away from me, for I am a sinful man. This experience is not unique to Peter. We see it throughout the Bible as people encounter the divine. It's not some vague feeling of warmth and comfort. There is an encounter with God. Daniel, when he encountered a divine being, said he was sick for days, like a dead man. When Job saw God, he said, I've heard of you before, but now that I see you, I abhor myself and I repent. When Isaiah saw God, in Isaiah chapter 6, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. He said, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. This is the reaction of people when they come into the presence of a holy God and realize I am unworthy, I am a sinner, I am undone. And until you have had that experience in the presence of God, you haven't truly come close to God. You may be standing afar off and feeling the attraction, the pull, because Jesus is attractive. But when you get up close, you're gonna feel repulsed. And don't be alarmed. Don't get the idea in, the, in your head that if you feel repulsion towards Jesus that somehow you're having uh, the wrong reaction. No, no, this, this is very normal and appropriate and right. When a sinner comes into the presence of a holy God, we feel like we do not belong there. I am undone, I am unmade, I'm shaking in my boots in the presence of this almighty, holy, all-seeing, all-knowing God. And I don't deserve to be here. Peter falls down and says, get away from me. I am a sinful man. But it is in that very moment of realization, that attraction and repulsion that's going on, that Jesus extends the call to Peter and says, don't be afraid. Follow me. And from here on out, you're going to catch people. Isaiah experienced the same thing. It was in the moment, as he's in the presence of God, saying, woe is me, I am undone, that he hears the call of God himself. Who will go for us? And Isaiah steps forward and says, here I am, send me. The call to follow Jesus, the call to join with Jesus in his mission, follows right on the heels of the realization of who he is. Let's explore what that means. What does it mean to leave everything and follow Jesus? We see it in this passage with Peter, with James and John. We see it with Levi, Levi Matthew, the tax collector. It says they left everything and followed him. I think we sometimes misunderstand what this means, and so we don't follow. Because Jesus is clearly asking a lot, and we evaluate in our minds and we say, I'm not quite sure I'm able to give up everything. What does this mean? What is Jesus actually asking of a disciple? To leave everything? Does that mean I have to turn my back on my family and never talk to them again? Does it mean I'm, I'm going to just walk out of my workplace and never look back and say, don't even bother sending me my final check? What does it mean to leave everything to follow Jesus? Is it practical? For these men... There was no question in their minds. They had seen this miracle. They had encountered Jesus. They wanted to be with him. But what did that look like in their lives? Did it mean they cut themselves off from family? Did it mean that they never went back to fishing? Did it mean that from here on out it was 24-7, nothing but preaching the gospel? No, that isn't what it looked like. What had changed, though, is that now their lives were gonna be ordered according to Jesus, instead of according to their own desires and their own plans. You and me, we have plans for our lives, don't we? We have ideas and 
Some of us here are very young and some of us are not so young. And some of us have experienced the realization of many of our plans and the frustration of many of our plans. But all of us still have ideas for the future. Where we're planning to go on vacation next, when we can. And what kind of work we're hoping to do a year from now. We have ideas for the future. And Jesus says to us, I'm calling you to follow me. And what that means is I want you to hold your plans very loosely because I have better plans for you. And maybe they're going to be different than the plans that you have. In fact, quite likely, they're going to be different. My plans for my life, if I were following my own course, would be plans very much about my status, my privilege, my money. And I'd be in life for myself. And I'd probably be putting, doing my best to put a veneer of uh, kindness on that so that people thought well of me as I pursued greed. By the way, as Americans, we, we especially struggle with the God of greed because we recognize that lust is a problem. We recognize certain sins that, that are issues, but most of us don't see greed as a problem, and that's because we're Americans, and it's part of our national identity to um, work hard and climb the ladder and get a good job and make lots of money, and that's what you're supposed to do if you're a, a good, proud American. But going through life and charting a course based on the desire for wealth is antithetical to following Jesus. And when Jesus calls a person to follow him, he says, I call you to leave that behind. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to have no money, but it does mean that there is a different motive in life, and you will follow Jesus wherever he leads. Some of you sitting here today are in full-time ministry. Some of you, God may be calling you to full-time ministry. And if so, don't neglect that call. But for the majority of us here today, Jesus is not calling you to full-time Christian ministry. He is calling you to a life of following him, but in a variety of careers. And in fact, the way that we use the word career can sometimes be problematic. The early Protestants, after Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation, they referred, instead of careers, they referred to jobs as vocations. Do you realize what that word means? Vocation, from the same word from which we get the word voice. A vocation is a calling. You hear the voice of God calling you to a particular line of work. Jesus has work for his disciples to do in every field of legitimate human endeavor. Martin Luther explained it this way. He said, who provides food for people to eat? It comes from God. That's why we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. God is the provider of our bread and our food. Yet God uses people to provide food. So Martin Luther says the farmer is a minister of God. A minister, just as much as a preacher is a minister of God, a farmer is a minister and is a vehicle by which God provides food to people. We could extend that and say the truck driver who drives the produce from the farm to wherever, the distribution point and ultimately the grocery store, that truck driver is a minister of God. The grocer, the manager of that grocery store, the people who stock the shelves, the people who mop the floors, the cashiers, they are ministers of God if they will simply view their work as a vocation, a calling from God. The call is first of all to follow Jesus and then in everything that we do, the activities of life have shifted from being about us and fulfilling our dreams and goals, and they are now about following Jesus. 
Jesus is calling and has called everyone here to some line of work. And there is great dignity in mopping a floor if that's what Jesus has called you to do. Taking out the garbage. It's a calling from the Lord. There is no menial or low work when we answer the call of Jesus to follow him and to serve. And it is all service. Now, obviously, there are some illegitimate types of work. We could think of several, like drug dealers. They're not ministers of God, necessarily. But uh, most of the jobs out there, they are means of serving people, and that is a calling from God. The call to follow Jesus and to be a disciple. By the way, Jesus didn't just call 12 we, we cannot excuse ourselves from answering the call by saying, that was for 12 guys back then. When we get to the book of Acts, and we will, we find that the descriptor, the disciples, was just a way of referring to the believers, the Christians. In fact, the book of Acts rarely uses the term Christians. Most frequently, the believers, the followers of Jesus, those who are being saved and on the path with Jesus, they are called the disciples. If you are a Christian, you are a disciple. It's not an optional thing. Sometimes we get the idea that discipleship is optional, that you can come to church and be a Christian, but discipleship is for the elite, maybe for the full-timers, the the full-time, those at full-time in Christian ministry, or maybe the extreme, the missionaries, their disciples, the rest of us, we can just sit in the pews and go about our lives. It's not optional. Discipleship is the thing. There is no other saving relationship with Jesus except discipleship. The call to follow Jesus is a life and death matter. It begins with the realization, this is, is not an ordinary man. And then the call, follow me. And there's the leaving of an old life behind, and there's a new loyalty, and there's a new direction in life, and there are new motives, and everything is new in following Jesus. And it's radical, and it's scary. And that's why I want to finish by talking about the provision of Jesus. We've talked about the realization We've talked about leaving everything to follow. And now we need to talk about the provision and why it is so, <laughs> so important that we accept this call and we need not be afraid. This last summer when we were all in lockdown, my family and I, stuck at home for some weeks, started watching the TV series, The Chosen. I trust many of you have seen that. If you haven't, I do highly recommend it. It's the story of Jesus portrayed um, in a very faithful way with, with some artistic license and creative interpretation, but very faithful to the, to the scriptures overall. And so I can't help, as, as I read through the story of the calling of these first disciples, I, I see the actors from The Chosen portraying this in this miraculous catch of fish. But something else clicked for me as I was studying the passage this week, something that Pastor James said as we were talking about the passage and then thinking about the chosen and the realization of what Jesus was doing in terms of his provision as he makes this call. If you've seen the chosen, you may remember the scene where Jesus is talking to Peter's wife and he's called Peter to follow him. And he says to Peter's wife, I'm calling him to follow me and that's gonna take him away from home quite a bit and I know it's gonna be a hardship for you and I want you to know that I see you. Now of course that's not in the Bible, but I found that to be such a moving scene that I think is true to the spirit of what's happening here. Because right before this call, what happened? 
Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. So before Jesus is calling Peter to this radical new way of life, he is reassuring Peter and the whole family, I will provide for you. You have a sick mother-in-law, I'm going to heal her. And what about these fish? It is the largest catch that Peter has ever seen. All of those fishermen on the lake have never seen a catch like this. They need multiple boats, and still the boats are sinking. There are so many fish. In the moment of the call, when Jesus asks Peter to leave everything and follow him, Jesus provides this abundant heap of provision. And I'm pretty sure those fish did not sit on the shore and rot. Those fish got used by those families. It was the provision of Jesus and his reassurance that as you step out and risk everything to follow me, I know it's scary, I am going to take care of you. The things you think you are giving up in order to follow me, you're giving up your mud puddles, and I'm offering you a banquet. You think it's hard to follow me, Jesus says? Come on, people. Come on. The little trinkets that you hold on to in your life, I'm offering you eternal riches. I will provide for you, and it will be abundant, and it will be good, and this life of following me is a far better life than the life you have planned for yourself. I don't know where you're at in your life. Some of you are beginning the journey, and some of you are near the end of life on this earth. And perhaps you've already had that experience of coming face to face with the Almighty God of the universe. You've had that experience of saying, woe is me, get away from me. If you haven't had that yet, you will if you keep coming close to Jesus. And I pray that when you do, you'll also realize that Jesus is not going to run away from you. <laughs> Jesus doesn't answer all of our prayers. Isn't that wonderful? Peter says, get away from me, and Jesus doesn't run away. Jesus instead says, don't be afraid. Follow me. And I hope and pray for each one of you that in that moment of realization, in the, in the ongoing moments of your life, as you realize more deeply who he is, that you will answer the call, that you will hear his voice. And even now, Jesus is calling. He is speaking to each one of us here. Will you follow me? Will you turn away from your old life and your dreams and your ideas of how life should be? And will you trust me and follow me wherever it may take you? He has good plans, and he will provide. Let us pray. O oh Lord, faithful, mighty, holy God, help us to experience this realization that Peter did, that you are this incredible, amazing creator, Savior, and we are totally unworthy. Help us to have that realization and also to hear your call. O oh Lord, I pray that call would go clearly out to the hearts and minds of every person here and that you would give us the courage to answer the call, yes, Lord, I will follow thee, my Savior. It's in your name we ask. Amen.